so I'm going to just uh, provide a couple of uh, Pecha Kucha related housekeeping notes. The main uh, item of note is we're asking each of the cohort teams, because as far as I can tell, uh, we have 10 Pecha Kuchas lined up here. Um, if you could put the name of your speaker in the chat, so cohort A equals speaker uh, speaker's name, then that will allow Chantel to put you in the spotlight, which basically means that we will see your video only uh, while you're presenting. So um, cohort A, if you're able to indicate your speaker, then that will help us uh, get things queued up since you'll be the first to go. Um, so just a reminder, and maybe for some of the folks that weren't able to make yesterday, uh, today's a uh, keynote session, if you will, is actually a, a Pechacucha, or the, which is the English version of the Japanese term uh, for chit chat. So each of the 10 cohorts has 15 slides, and I am going to automatically adv advance those slides every 20 seconds. So each of the, our 10 speakers has five minutes total. Uh, there may or may not be a sea shanty or two in the mix, I'm not sure. Um, and the uh, while the instruction was each slide can only have one image or one word, not both, uh, many of you or some of you, a couple of you took my slide from yesterday where I said be creative and then I had a couple of other terms. So some of you were creative and it had, had a little extra content to your slides, which is absolutely fine. That's uh, the nature of uh, a close knit community like this. Um, so I do, I will ask you to keep yourself on time. So when you see your last slide, uh, finish up and because uh, I, it will automatically go to the next. So when you, if you're in cohort A and you see cohort B slide come up, then you know that you need to do a transition and, and mute yourself and the next person will be spotlighted. And then once we're done, I will uh, share my screen with the upvote tool just to reiterate for folks how that works. And I'll also have the link to that tool. The link to the upload tool is also, uh, if it's not in your notes, I will make sure that I put it in the chat because uh, there are actually two, what are called upload boards. One is for all of the work you're doing in the breakouts and the second board is for the Pecha Pe Pe Um So I'll make sure to put that link in the chat. Uh, at the appropriate time. So are we lined up with our cohort A presenter? If so, you can, uh, who was, oh, Jeremy. So I believe uh, Christy is starting. Um, our Christy's starting? And then okay. I'll pick up halfway through. And Christy, do yes. you? Okay, so I just was going to get you to test your audio, so you're good to go. Okay, so I will go to the first slide and then I'll advance them as we go. Um, and if anybody has any specific questions, put them in the chat, but otherwise, uh, off we go. Okay, hi. Uh, thinking about open science and data management, uh, when I think of science data, I think of big data, data floods, the data deluge. The open data movement often seems to focus on these kind of big interoperable, largely impersonal machine actionable data sets to feed the, well, what you might call the hungry tiger of data science. With big issue data, the issue is storing it, processing it, turning algorithms loose on it and letting them do their thing, letting them eat it up. More open, more data, Big data scientists are hungry for data and having open data can lead to really big gains. But for other scientists and researchers, data arrives as a trickle. Carefully curated small data sets, each data point lovingly collected through active research and measurement or collaboration with research subjects. These researchers are quite different. They, they're not hungry in the same way. They think of their data more like, well, a kitten 
a small data kitten that needs curation, tender loving care. The issue is not letting researchers at the fire hose of interoperable big data gains, but protecting something small and squishy that was produced and fed by hand that the researcher nurtured and may feel very protective of. And might have they might have legitimate safety concerns around releasing these defenseless and tasty data sets into the wild. They're worried that their data sets might be attacked by unethical snakes like re-identification, misinterpretation, stealing academic credit. And the burden of protecting these data sets is all on the researchers. They're the ones that have to keep this small, squishy data safe. So it's no wonder that many of them are wary of the idea of sending these defenseless, cute, tiny little data sets out into the wild. So. How do we reduce that burden? Infrastructure? If we're asking these researchers to set their data free, we need to support them. Training is an important element of that, but training still leaves the burden of doing all this on the researcher. We're just telling them how to do it. We also need to think about things like rewarding researchers with academic credit, and we do need infrastructure, but infrastructure is hard for small squishy data. While we're making strides with big data, infrastructure for small data is harder. For example, data anonymization while preserving utility is still a basically unsolved problem in computer science. It has huge risks to the researcher of violating ethics. So open science is really like the holy grail that we're all seeking. And the FAIR principles are one of the key avenues to get, a, get us there. But unfortunately, there are key challenges blocking implementation of FAIR and we have to attack those challenges in a comprehensive way, not in a piecemeal fashion. So there has been progress on implementing the FAIR principles, specifically around findability and accessibility, but interoperability, interoperability remains a key challenge. Interoperability of platforms, processes, and data. And achieving interoperability will, res will result in a research, e research ecosystem that is most excellent. Incentives pose another challenge. We want to implement incentives so that researchers share their data, not because they have to, but because they see it as an offer they can't refuse. So how do we get there? Collaboration is one of the key elements. No one stakeholder can get there alone. We have to utilize our specific policy levers, capacities, and skills to get to our destination. So high level policy statements and mandates are important. So for example, the FAIR principles and the DORA principles and so on. But we also must recognize that in addition to high level mandates, we need, we need targeted and specific interventions. We also must remember not to speak of um, in terms of disciplines as if they were all just one thing. We have to recognize disciplinary diversity and that they all have different uh, norms and uh, focuses and cultures. Finally, Mark, I just wanted to thank you for organizing this Pikachu. Uh, we all know that Pikachu is everyone's favorite Pokemon and this Pikachu has been a lot of fun. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. That was a, a good uh, a good start to our event. And indeed, Sean, is, feel free to indicate claps um, if you wish. Um, so uh, do I understand from the chat, uh, we don't have a presenter for cohort B, is that correct? That's right, Mark. Okay. So let me give you a little whirlwind view here. Some good, some good images, some uh, properly cited, um, some bonus points there. Uh, so cohort C is, who's presenting for cohort C? Barton is. Uh, Barton, 
Gotcha. All right, so you're ready, Burton? More or less. Okay, so our cohort discussed um, a sustainable framework of data stewardship, education, and training to researchers. Get it? Um, now, our train went off the tracks a little bit on the first question. We were supposed to be talking about um, training for RDM services. Instead, we wound up talking about general training needs. Uh, there was the, uh, the observation that uh, more than anything else, the researchers need time to do this sort of thing. Uh, the, the work that they do with data today, it's not really counted in their professional lives. It doesn't uh, give them any credit towards tenure. Um, the, the effort is not really recognized. Uh, so there was a, a recognition that we do need to incentivize training and data management generally. Uh, there need to be rewards for data management and data sharing, and also uh, uh, for expertise in sharing and data management. There's a suggestion that RDC could perhaps train universities, disciplines, and importantly, funders to treat data sharing in the same way as a publication when it comes to promotion and, and tenure. So there was the uh, suggestion, uh, as I said, about treating uh, the publication of a data set in the same way that we treat a publication of a research paper. Um, and when you consider the, the, the time and money and effort that went into these vast data sets for uh, um, machine learning, and think of the, the world changing benefits that that enabled, these data sets are important and they should be recognized. Um, there needs to be a similar sort of evaluative structure. Uh, the, we don't know exactly what that might be, but similar to journal articles, the quality of a data set uh, needs to be measured and evaluated. Uh, there is a note that uh, more researchers should be part of a team in putting together uh, RDM trainers. Um, researchers acting as trainers in a mentorship role, perhaps, or as a secondments uh, from their institution to RDC. And of course, this raises obvious questions about, about funding. Um, another training need that came out was the need for training in ethical and legal considerations, uh, issues of data regulations, intellectual property, interjurisdictional compliance. Um, and if not training, perhaps, then what about guidance and advice? Uh, research data management, it's, it's not magic, it's, it's uh, a need to, to formalize good practices. Uh, we need to make it capture uh, what we're already doing well and not treat it as some new additional task. Uh, I got no uh, notes for this slide at all. It's just a picture of a cat and that's always a good thing. The second question we tackled was what type of training opportunities facilitate the adoption of good RDM practices? Uh, the last speaker mentioned this as well. We need to recognize that there are discipline specific needs. Each discipline, um, their data has uh, different scales, different access requirements, different workflows. All of these things need to be supported. And there was also the recognition that not all researchers are the same. Um, people are at different points in their careers. They have different degrees of uh, expertise. Um, consider the, uh, the, the grad student. What, are, uh, what needs do they have for, for training? So ideally the training material, it should be uh, self-paced. It should be on demand, modular. Uh, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. Uh, we should look at what's being done well in other countries, other fields, um, ask other fields what they're doing well. Uh, let's look at mechanisms to sh support sharing. Um, 
Uh, and again, we need to reward sharing or make it easier for researchers to, to do what they, what they want to do in the first place. They want to share. We just need to help them make it possible. Um, we talked about emerging technologies and helping the adoption of um, these new enabling technologies. Uh, we talked about the, the data carpentry uh, programs that are out there. They are excellent. And uh, also the, the work that DHS and NIST is doing to support uh, technology adoption. Whew, uh, let's see. Um, yes, more talk about uh, enabling. This, this was particularly about technologies that enable sharing and exchange of data. Uh, there's a lot of talk about distributed ledgers. Now, um, seeing is believing. So we talked about the creation of a small pilot projects um, that could demonstrate uh, the use of technologies and inspire their adoption. This is just a happy conclusion to the slide presentation. A round of applause for me, please. <laughs> Good work. Um, it's for those that haven't done a presentation before doing a Pecha Kucha is a very different kind of style. Uh, so I appreciate our first two, uh, or first three presenters. That, those are all great. I really love that uh, data management isn't spread like butter. It's like tending a garden. That's a great quote. Um, all right, so Mike, you're next. Yeah, speaking right. of a format. I will pass it over to you then. All right, today I'll be reading from that well-known children's story, Llama Llama DMP. Uh, it's part of the famous series by Anna Dudney. Uh, children's books have pretty important moral lessons. Uh, I've been advocating for data management planning for a long time, and it's amazing how similar some of our messaging is to what we teach in kindergarten. All right, here we go. Llama Llama does research on the movement of white perch. Now he's funded time to start get some students to take part. What kind of training do they need? Oh, just R and stats and they'll succeed. Llama, llama, DMP? <laughs> Those dull things are not for me. Put some sensors in a lake. We'll have data by daybreak. Get the data, store it quick. Anywhere will do the trick. Laptop or a USB, any format's fine with me. File names, they're up to you. I have urgent things to do. When funding for this work is gone, I'll try to pass the data on. Box of hard drives, call IT. Can you store my CSVs? This data is important, so I'll leave my box right here and go. Manage data, not my job. Llama, llama, data slob. Time to process data now. Llama Llama wonders how. Where's that data? Can you see? Why are all these rows named T? Cannot read from USB. Hard drive error, sector three. Here is June, but where's July? It's named River. Tell me why. It's been a month and I forget. Llama Llama in cold sweat. Losing data would be bad. Llama Llama getting mad. What a mess, can't work like this. Yell and curse in the abyss before more poo poo hits the fan. Llama Llama needs a plan. Time to write a DMP, get help from the library. They educate and do outreach, lots to learn and lots to teach. How we store and how we name. Document the study aim. Our column names, they will not vary using a vocabulary. File names and backups best, encrypt the data when at rest. When you can, please make it fair. Llama Llama likes to share. To implement a DMP, shared responsibility. If we'll manage data well, we must work in parallel. The library provides supports based on the portage reports. 
DMP Assistant 2, RDC, and Funders 2. Data to the universe through further or the dataverse. Discipline specific, please, like C's and CADCs. Endrio, that name has stuck. We'll change the game with any luck. Unified, we all will be DM, RS, and ARC. Betty, what does Endrio mean? Well, kids, once upon a time, some people were making a new organization and they figured that they would just come up with the name for it later. So they called it the New Data Research Infrastructure Organization or Endrio. It's been years and later still hasn't come. And I think people are starting to realize that they could just change the new to national and the name would stick. But hey, kids, wake up, wake up, I'm still reading. Llama Llama has more notes. A rising tide will lift more, will lift all boats. Data literate we all should be across the university. Train the students in degree. Learning early is the key. SPIs may be too late. They have too much on their plate. Llama Llama's on the team. He loves it like he loves ice cream. What will it take to reach this dream? Money is a common theme, but it's investment, not expense. Saving dollars, costing cents. Llama Llama tells his friends, open data dividends. Things of value aren't all free. Someone has to pay, you see. Spread the word if you agree, it will grow organically. I'll help you and you help me, all thanks to our DMP. Llama Llama, so happy with his friends in cohort D. The end. Oh, that's great. <laughs> good job. The uh, focus on the uh, creative again. That's good. Good. Always good. And uh, somebody said, is it Jeff? Sorry, there was my timer. <laughs> uh thanks mike and uh, cohort d uh jeff are you next unfortunately mark <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> my god what an act to follow thanks a lot mike <laughs> that was amazing oh there you go all right all right uh, off you go let's get going all right these western hemlock nurse logs represent one of the underpinnings of sustainability the approach of growing new initiatives upon existing ones, adopting successful methods, standards, tools, and more. Building sustainable DRI will rely upon a solid foundation. Witness the work of Portage in partnering, developing, and deploying foundational training tools, services, platforms and infrastructure for both researchers and institutions. Building sustainable DRI will take confidence. We'll need to take risks to try new things and to not be afraid of failure. Building sustainable DRI will require interoperability, including adoption of persistent identifiers, such as DOIs for data objects and ORCID IDs for authors. This was a new one for me. This, this murmuration of starlings taking flight captured in this startling bird-shaped formation is representative of the key role of interoperability in supporting sustainable DRI. If these things work well together, software, hardware, standards, and people, DRI can take flight. Building sustainable DRI takes collaboration. Synergies between our research software and data management are one of the key value propositions of Endrio, and collaboration will be essential to supporting these synergies. 
Building sustainable DRI will require long-term stable and coordinated funding. We've heard loud and clear from researchers that the vagaries of cyclical funding present a clear and present barrier to effective DRI. Timing is key. As this picture illustrates, building sustainable DRI will require flexibility around the timing of funding. For instance, we need to be able to strategically plan for and time hardware purchases when needed, not just when the year-end budget has money to spend. Here are two ducks, each standing on one leg and looking in opposite directions. And how does this relate to DRI, you may ask? I'm not sure, but maybe it's because ducks are really incredible. Building sustainable DRI will require standards to keep us on track. This means development, promotion, and adoption of standards for disciplines, hardware, metadata, software, and more to keep our efforts aligned and effective. Building sustainable DRI will take tenacity. We are in this for the long haul and need to keep this in mind as we build the systems, processes, policies, and procedures to support sustainable DRI. Building sustainable DRI will require good communication and effective management of expectations. She was expecting an iPad. Building sustainable DRI will require culture change. And evoking Boromar, one does not simply change academic culture overnight. Expert support for researchers will be key to this culture change. Building sustainable DRI will require openness as well, not just in the sense of open data, open access, and open source, but also openness to new ideas and new ways of doing things. Someone once told me that hope is not a strategy, but hope was, and is an essential part of any successful strategy and enterprise. And we have high hopes for RDM under Andrio going forward. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. I'm, I'm so inspired, I wish I... <laughs> this is a, uh, a very creative bunch. Um, I may have to rethink the... Um, upvoting and just send bling to everybody else. <laughs> Clearly, uh, there's been a lot of uh, effort gone into this one. So that's awesome. Uh, so Peter is our next presenter. Are you ready, Peter? Yes, I'm ready. Thanks. All right. OK, so researchers may think primarily in terms of their data. So here's a scene that is no doubt familiar to most researchers. I'm sure that Mark has been showing us the neatest corner of his office as a backdrop. He probably has a pile of notebooks that are just off screen somewhere hiding under his desk. So we think of data as researchers. What we think of less often, fewer researchers give enough thought to metadata. So that is data about data. Uh, these are all the identifying fields that make it possible to categorize, analyze, and retrieve our data. A keyword search is probably the most simple form of this. When a Star Trek Android gets involved, that's called metadata squared. Metadata means many things to many people. It contains many different types of information about the data itself or themselves. In some instances and for some users, the metadata itself may be the primary item of interest. For others, the metadata may not be immediately relevant, although it is crucial for all users. Metadata is attached to the data and it should travel with the data. It is not to be confused with the data object itself but it allows us to contextualize the data object and identify it. 
And I'll note that this is only the second cat I've seen during these uh, Zoom meetings, which is itself quite unusual. It takes a lot of metadata to make data meaningful because there is so much context around the data. Ideally, the metadata allows the data itself to float and be accessible. However, we also want to ensure that the metadata itself doesn't cause the information equivalent of a nautical disaster. To help people who want to use your data, you need to add the metadata to make that information as valuable for other people as it is to you. A researcher's most groundbreaking discovery has an audience of exactly one if other researchers can't find it. Adding metadata can be a lot of work, and we have to be careful that that work isn't simply added to the already considerable workload of the research community. If the system itself has a better understanding of the data, we can create tools that can automate filling metadata fields. Having metadata allows the systems to communicate with each other, but the metadata need to be compatible for this to happen effectively. With standards and identifiers, the data can become much more interconnected and accessible to a much wider range of users. If you don't have good metadata, you can lose information out of the leakiness of the system. Poor connections mean that the data doesn't flow. Like your plumbing, the whole system works well if all of the interconnections are watertight. When you turn on the information tap, you want that information to flow. Researchers use their data to communicate with others and good metadata lets them reach a wider audience and to be more accurate. We've already heard about the importance of sharing and exchanging data and metadata is an essential component of that process. We have to think carefully about relevant metadata as well as generic fields. We need to use the metadata that fits the domain. For some users, standard metadata fields may be entirely adequate. For others, the most important metadata may not be captured in our metadata fields. Indigenous communities, for example, may be operating within quite different systems of knowledge management that may be incommensurable with our own. So we need to reference standards for data to be interoperable. If the research community cannot agree on basic standards for metadata, then we may face a confused system of data management. Metadata are for both machines and for people. Some metadata need to be machine readable, and that may be alienating for human users. Other metadata have a primarily human audience, and for that human audience, binary code may not be particularly useful. So we need to think carefully about who it is that's accessing our data through the metadata we attach. Think of your metadata as a love note to the future. If you value your data, and all researchers do, Consider how others in the future may also value it, sometimes in very different ways. Your data is precious, and so is your metadata. Accurate descriptions, discoverability, interoperability, saving on data entry, those are all the benefits of a good metadata system. But you don't have to travel to Mordor and bite someone's finger off about it either. Thank you very much. Well, that was great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, ABCDF, cohort F. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my alphabet there for a sec. Um, I'm, I'm picturing Mike Smith and all the rest of our data-focused iSchool uh, faculty using this as RDM 101 Lecture 8. Uh, so, Chantal, I guess you're next? Yes. Thank you, Mark. All right, off you go. Uh, so uh, the context was to recognize the supernatural approach um, and what's highlighting the engagement needs and to be effectively resourced. So we focus on that sort of thing. Um, we'll be discussing the importance of consistent messaging internationally to provide curation where the researchers are. So they tend not to go directly to the library or the repository, instead to the journals. So we're thinking of a strategy to improve metadata and documentation shifting culture from that. 
Um, so to collaborate internationally, we would benefit from establishing practices nationally to support our national partners in pursuing communication solutions between journals and repositories. And so they're informing appropriately where they do not exist. Um, we're committed to, so another context was Canada as a leader internationally, best practices and standards. We're hoping to inform on that. So speaking nationally because it will influence international partnerships um, in standards, journals, and communities of practice are international by design and they collaborating with them will be informing on them. Um, but difficult to identify potential international collaborators or RDC is a dating service for data. It'll allow us to swipe right on international collaboration. Uh, education and support on DM practice will help improve processes. Canada does not yet have the requirement for years coming. Availability of local and national repositories varies in countries and cultures. Um, and international data and documentation standards are emerging. Um, the approach and levels of service vary though. So the discussion is important. Research data dissemination is closely related to article publishing and publishers are very diverse um, in business models and not aware or really care about repository options or long-term preservation. So in an internationally coordinated relationship and strategy for data dissemination and preservation um, is a much needed bridge to the gap and to support a guideline to researchers through the publication process. Um, they sh there should be a group and or forum headed by a national organization, I'm not sure who would be appropriate, and Andrio RDC Portage. Uh, where we can meet um, with interested stakeholders, stakeholders to discuss needs and coordinate. Um, journals and other publishing platforms, many of them are, are international, are newly developed data policies and requirements. Uh, they function as mandate to researchers, influencing Canadian researcher behavior. But without a national policy on data deposit, can, Canadian researchers are starting to deposit simply because journals require data avail availability statements, and that's not enough. So in addition to data deposit policy and statements, we can work towards developing or point to existing it generic guidelines for researchers. So pointing to um, university library, a suggested repository, a national RDM organization where they can receive more detailed guidance. Um, these generic guidelines would ideally be available from the journal website submission instructions and highlight them um, just to make it clear. And better coordination and access to information will improve the metadata and documentation being included in submissions and will improve discoverability of Canadian research data for international collaborators to discover Canadian partners and vice versa. Uh, guidelines and resources should have consistent messaging across, uh, across platforms and countries. There are policy and legal issues, especially, essential, sorry, especially when data is collected and shared in an international and open environment. This challenge has to be discussed and settled through international partnerships. Journals with international authors are already international communities. Reaching publishers and societies to put data policies in place means a consistent set of policies. Um, so journals are building an international network and standard that way. Um, this approach can further influence those disciplinary community practice since some of them are publishers and host disciplinary journals. The disciplinary communities of practice are often international and national, so reaching up to them and then down into their members will let us leverage current and future researchers. Part of a generational mind shift and even a venue for integrating RDM into research ethics and integrity conversation considerations. Um, so to disseminate. Um, Canada, Canada should continue to be active in international RDM organizations and initiatives. They share our coordinated experiences and lessons learned with the international community to enforce in the efforts of further developing policies and guidelines that are consistent or workable across country and community boundaries. And um, Canadian research RDM or Canadian RDM needs to have an international strategy. Um, th through international partnership and collaboration, um, Canadian RDM development can better inform by and aligned with international development at multiple areas and levels. Uh, technical and standard alignment for fair metadata standards, policy alignment, institutional policy, national policy, repository, journal policy, infrastructure alignment. So consider Canada's relationship to European, Europe and legal and ethical frameworks. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> No apologies necessary. Thanks, Chantel. Uh, appropriate uh, choice of iconographics there for the international uh, piece. So that's uh, a good choice. Thank you.
Uh, who's up next? Is that Allison? Yes. And who yeah. do you have with you, Allison? Uh, so I, we don't have a picture of a cat in our slide, so I figured <laughs> I would just get my cat bacon because she loves data deposit. Oh, there you so, go. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Off you go. Okay. Uh, so yes, cats love data deposit. Uh, so data deposit, what is it? Um, it's the act of depositing data into a repository for potential sharing. And there are a lot of considerations that researchers, uh, librarians, funders, publishers, government agencies need to take into consideration when looking at data deposit. So the biggest thing in the Canadian landscape right now is that um, researchers really can decide whether or not they're going to uh, opt in to share their data. Um, we can decide on the restrictions. Um, you know, will your data be accessible to everyone? Will it be by request? Is it going to be under an embargo? There's no mandate in Canada for data sharing right now, but there will be soon. Uh, so there are a number of barriers uh, to data sharing that people perceived. They may sometimes be real. They may sometimes be perceived barriers. Um, I'm only going to touch on a few of them for some of the specific stakeholders now, um, but really it can be a lot, lack of knowledge, lack of time, lack of training. Um, there's a lot to know about this. So in the library world, one of the barriers um, is that there's a lack of resources for library staff and data curators uh, for helping people deposit their data. Um, often for librarians, this is in addition to a lot of other responsibilities and we don't have the training or we have to go out and find it ourselves in order to figure out how to help people deposit their data. For funders, um, it's really hard to come up with policies that are broad enough to cover off the many different types of research that are out there, but still be specific enough to be meaningful and relevant for the applicants. Um, in addition, you know, our tri-agency policy is coming up, but how will that be enforced or audited or tracked? It's not gonna be effective unless you can do tracking and make sure that people are uh, depositing their data. Likewise, for publishers, um, they need to support the efforts of funders and libraries. Um, you know, for the big five publishers, the, the Wileys, the Elseviers, they can set up the infrastructure, they can uh, set up their own data repositories. But what about those smaller publishers that don't have a lot of money? You know, the, um, the medical journal of um, Rwanda, say, uh, they might not have the funds. Uh, likewise, government agencies, um, there's a lot of barriers there. They want, they're working to make data open, but they also need to be aware of when you're not, when you shouldn't share data. Um, there's a lot of barriers when setting up data sharing agreements with institutions. They can be on onerous sometimes. Uh, Canada's roadmap to open science was just published last year. Um, it exists. Can we adhere to it? Uh, and then with researchers, they might be wary of depositing their data. They don't trust the the repositories. They may not want their data to be open for fear of being scooped. We need a culture change so that they do trust that. And that's going to come with training. Uh, somebody mentioned a culture change earlier. Another thing we have to think about, and it's not an, a barrier, but many people do think of it as a barrier, unfortunately, but it's really essential to think about ethics when deciding how and where to deposit your data. Can you share it? Do you own it? So there's so many things to think about here, um, various different issues such as indigenous data, personal health or financial information, uh, location of danger, endangered species. So there's tons of things to think about when thinking about the ethics. Um, we talked about uh, data deposit models and how many, how there are very different models for data deposit. Um, you know, you can publish in an institutional data repository that might be appropriate like Dataverse or a disciplinary data repository like Polar Data Catalog. Uh, we thought it's important to have a model where data is a publication and gets a PID uh, that can link to other related items. This is the, the um, obligatory carrot and stick photo here. Um, and when we're talking about data deposit, we a lot of people feel like it's a stick, but it's really important to change that culture and think about data deposit as a carrot rather than sticks. And that will help get people more on board and change that culture. So there's a lot of benefits to um, data sharing and depositing in data repositories. Uh, far too many to speak about in this short presentation. So I'll just mention a couple of them, um, but transparency is a really, really big one. Um, the next one is money. It's, it's the responsible thing to do with public funds. With more and more awareness around research funding and how much data there is and in a 
climate where it's so competitive to get funding, the public wants researchers to be accountable. And they want to show that the funds are being put to a good use and, and advancing science. Um, in addition to that, another big advantage of depositing data is to advance science by standing on the shoulders of others and building upon that work so that uh, data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Basically, de depositing data is one step towards making that data more fair. So researchers might ask, well, what's in it for me? Um, so really, what is in it for them? Lots of stuff. More collaborations with other researchers. Um, they can get data citations in addition to publication or in addition to article citations. Um, they can use data from others for peer review, for verification of their research results, and hopefully to get more grants. We'd like to see that if you get a grant and you do what you're supposed to do, then you continue getting grants. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Allison. That was great. Um, as I said, at the risk of being a broken record, it's a great, uh, a great way to introduce everybody to some of the separate conversations that have been happening uh, in our breakouts. And uh, Karen, is it you going for I? Yep, I'm ready. Okay. Yep. Uh, off you go. Okay, so I think if you were to poll the members of cohort I, we would agree unanimously that uh, for the life of me, I can't figure out how to say Pikachu ketchup or whatever it is. So much less do one. So uh, I'm fortunate that Mike uh, Alchin is gonna uh, split the responsibilities with me. I'm gonna do the first half of our messages and, and Michael will do the second. Um, we, we began by recognizing that we don't know what the needs of the researchers are yet. And so we can't make a plan to meet those needs. And so for folks who felt that the current NGO survey was a bit too long to participate in, um, we wanted to put a plug in for the upcoming virtual town hall discussions that could serve as a mechanism for NGO to identify uh, champions that can accelerate culture change in the RDM ecosystem. We had some pie in the sky visioning. Ideally, Canada will be creating an RDM infrastructure with the lowest barrier to entry as possible while simultaneously raising the bar for adhering to fair care and trust principles. Uh, in both cases, we recognize the disparity in institution size and resources. We would like to transition from a tiresome ecosystem into something that is easy and effective to use. Um, our goal should be frameworks and infrastructures that are as easy to use as Instagram, uh, but one that provides more value for researchers. Um, the notion that the good data management at the beginning of a project help organize the structure and the plan for research, not just the structure of the plan for the data as well. We recognize that a substantial effort and expense is involved in generating data and want to ensure that the investments made by the primary producers in an open RDM ecosystem are not exploited by non-contributing predators. Um, if you want to be a researcher-centric organization, the question is how can the tangible cost of generating useful open data be spread more widely amongst those who may benefit from them? It's perhaps an ambitious statement, but NGO could move towards requiring a machine actionable DMP for all funding awards, uh, ensure that it's integrated with publishing and funding systems, um, getting data management to this point <clears throat> seems to require an extreme amount of magic at this point, um, but I think that's the, uh, the longer term goal. Um, we don't envision this as a one and done process. Um, perhaps Andrea can identify key metrics that help with monitoring and evaluating DMPs uh, implementation across a project. Um, we envision an iterative process that includes a feedback loop from researchers to NGO about what does and what does not work for them. Um, we, we also recognize that data needs to, uh, needs representation from various groups across the domains. Um, we also agree it's important for representation across the diversity of the Canadian researchers and Canadian experience with an emphasis on listening to indigenous communities um, Nazir mentioned this as part of the authentically Canadian experience. The diversity of both the builders and the governance tables is a huge asset. So uh, as we were talking about governance, uh, our discussion strayed more and more into the role of uh, funding agencies in guiding researcher practice. So with apologies to cohort J, the second part of our section uh, really considers the role of funding agencies in the development and adoption standards. So standards are key in uh, identifying groupings, uh, identifying apples and apples and oranges and oranges, formulating queries and uh, passing responses. 
Of course, there are carrots and sticks. Funding agencies have the opportunity to wield both. Uh, if you promise to do it in an appropriate manner, we'll consider funding you. And if not, we may require a payment or not fund you in the future. And this process of uh, encouraging uh, a, a change in approach is effectively a culture shift. And if it's implemented equitably and sensitively, uh, then requiring adoption standards as a condition of funding could encourage this kind of culture shift among researchers. So they embrace the concept of sound data stewardship uh, as an essential component of rigorous research from the ground up. It could make sense, at least initially, for this to be guided by specialists within institutions such as data librarians. This may also streamline the process of uh, the um, research data management uh, and reduce the overall costs associated with conducting research, uh, thereby uh, reducing the amount of funding required. Uh, in time, wide update of a common data access framework will also assist the development of readily interoperable uh, software and advanced systems. But the challenge lies in uh, accommodating such an enormous variety of linkages and connectivities and distinctions within and across research fields. Extraordinarily challenging to uh, accommodate this within a nation, within different fields, uh, and internationally as well. Uh, and then there are questions of how deep to do this and how to future proof it. Uh, this is about overcoming inertia, how to negotiate and accommodate strongly held positions. Some people may have very well established data management procedures and, and be loath to uh, have to learn a new one and adopt new ones. Others may be quite happy with existing ad hoc processes and want to plug away with the way they've always done things. So there's a major change management task here. This is a daunting proposition. The point is that uh, you have to keep going. The first uh, effort is not gonna be perfect, uh, but keep going and we should get there with appropriate feedback uh, and an evolutionary process. Well, that's great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we have one more to go here. <clears throat> I'm hoping I'm going to uh, queue up my, my screen capture because I'm hoping what I'll be able to do is capture the screen of my Zoom window showing 100% hands clapping after this final uh, Pecha Kucha because it's been a, a great um, a great series of uh, presentations and Felicity you're the last one I guess so <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right so you're ready to go yeah um okay so I'm the moderator of cohort J and I just want to say thanks to everybody um in the group who helped to throw all these slides together. So I'm presenting, but the pictures come from everybody. Um, these slides are our call to infrastructure pr providers um, uh, in support of, of standards. Um, and it's ironic because I broke the rules of the Pecha Kucha, Kucha <laughs> with these slides <laughs> that I am speaking about standards today. Um, so we began by talking about how there are so many standards on all these different levels. Um, so it's a bit of an alphabet soup uh, of acronyms. We talked about how infrastructure providers um, could help uh, from the researcher perspective to sort through um, all these different standards um, and uh, create a commonality across platforms and across disciplines in order to enable data sharing, for example. Um, and so, but we came to the conclusion that compliance is not the message that we want from the infrastructure providers uh, in this area. And we don't want them to organize our alphabet soup into the word compliance. Uh, instead, we want certain kinds of engagement um, with, uh, that will enable the researcher community uh, and also the service providers who support the researcher community. And so one of the areas uh, where the engagement can come is uh, in the training, the provision of expertise or the training up of expertise. Uh, some institutions have um, available expertise, some disciplines have available expertise already built into their pipelines. We also want, uh, and others do not, uh, and then we also want um, the infrastructure providers to engage meaningfully with uh, 
the uh, social and legal frameworks that would allow for their infrastructure to support meaningful third party data stewardship agreements. Um, so we want it to come from the infrastructure providers themselves. Some of the challenges that we uh, see uh, for the infrastructure providers in, the, in, the, um, in this area, in the RDM area, uh, is that there will always be a tension between uh, the centralized kind of common shared infrastructure um, of certain disciplines and, um, uh, and certain standards adopters uh, versus a decentralized, specialized or sovereign kind of requirements of other, uh, of other areas and uh, data producers. Uh, another challenge is uh, balance. How do you uh, ensure that resources that are invested into uh, data infrastructure uh, aren't completely focused on the heavy data producers um, who work with normative standards and existing infrastructure? How do we create equity for disciplinary areas uh, that work, don't work in the constraints that, uh, that already exist? And then another challenge is uh, how to um, offset bias, uh, because if everything is built with the input of researchers or is researcher centered and we treat all researchers as kind of a homogenous group, you run the risk of only hearing the loudest voices and building the infrastructure again for people who are already using what's in place uh, and everybody else becomes the needy long tail. Uh, and also to balance out all of the cats that we've seen so far, uh, we also really want more puppies. Well, thank you, Felicity. Thank you, everybody. Um, I was wondering when somebody was going to get puppies in the, the mix here. Um, so it's good to see we've had a, a range of animal models, some great, uh, some great images. So maybe if folks want to access their hand clapping uh, emoji, I don't know if people know where to grab that, but if you do, Feel free to give our presenters and cohorts uh, a round of applause because I think uh, that was extremely well done. And as I said, uh, inspiring. So thank you very much for that. Um, so now we've, uh, and shockingly on time, so <laughs> it's perfect, exactly one hour after we uh, started that one. So we have uh, 15 minutes. So what I'm going to do is encourage you to go to this URL. So it's HTTPS. Uh, oh, somebody has, thank you, Carly. Carly's very helpfully put the link in your Zoom chat. Uh, so when you go to that URL, uh, this is what you're gonna see. So you will see the 10 packet cooch, Pechicucha, no, I'm having a problem pronouncing it as well. Uh, one of the, uh, I believe it was Team B, uh, did not present. If for some reason you feel it necessary to, to vote for a team that did not present, then it would be <laughs> Team B. Uh, otherwise, when you go into each of these um, upvoting items, you'll see this one's already been upvoted twice. Uh, so all you have to do is click upvote. You can only upvote one suggestion, uh, or sorry, you can only upvote each suggestion once. Uh, so when you upvote a suggestion, you can also add a comment. Uh, you have to put in your name and email. That I wasn't able to turn that off. So um, we obviously will scrub all this data and not use it um, in any particular form for uh, the event. Um, so just go to your respective uh, boards that you wish to upvote and uh, please uh, do your thing. Uh, I will stop sharing um, so as not to publicly influence the selection of, of a, uh, a team. And uh, I will let you do that for uh, the next 10 minutes while it's fresh in your minds and uh, then I will turn my audio back on and I'll introduce the breakouts for today. And <laughs> yes indeed as Scott says vote well vote often. My suggestion is that you vote for three a maximum of three sessions and uh, I will let you do that.
So I'll give you one more minute uh, and <clears throat> don't uh, don't rush to uh, to vote because that uh, upvote page for the Pe Pecha Kuchas will stay uh, there for the rest of the day. So if you weren't able to register your three votes and you would like to, then uh, take your time. And I'll give you just another minute to, and then I'll provide some context for the next two breakouts. Okay, I think we can uh, go ahead. I'm pretty sure there's a fair number of you that haven't uh, registered three votes. Uh, uh, we, because uh, looking at the uh, site, um, I see that the total uh, doesn't match up. But just looking at, uh, glancing at it, it uh, looks like a fairly clear front runner for Team D. Uh, which would be uh, Lama Lama. <laughs> so um, it's probably, I can't help but make the comment, but both my uh, wife Trina and I are librarians and even though our kids are now in their thirties, um, we still buy children's books fairly regularly, especially since my wife works in an independent bookstore. Um, so I can't, uh, recommend the Lama Lama books uh, any more highly than uh, Mike Smith's uh, presentation would suggest. They're a great series, very rich uh, set of books. So uh, if you do have uh, <clears throat> children or grandchildren, or you just love art and uh, a simple story, then uh, children's books uh, are highly recommended. So Team D looks like um, is in the lead and then were followed in a fairly close race with Team A, uh, which were our first presenters on open science, uh, Kirsty and uh, Jeremy. And then uh, Team E, which was the sustainability team, um, followed by Team G and Team J. So there's a fairly um, broad vote of support there for a lot of the session. So um, from my perspective, that simply says kudos uh, to all of you. So many thanks for your participation. As one of uh, our colleagues said, I can't believe Mark is making us do a presentation after day one. <laughs> so so uh, apologies to those of you um, who felt on the spot, but I think uh, obviously, I think it's uh, clear to say that uh, the, the opportunity enriched everybody uh, participating in the summit. So thank you very much for that. So um, I'm just a few kind of reminders on breakouts three and four. Um, one of the things that I, I think I forgot to mention, I may, I, it might've been hidden in the notes for moderators and note takers, um, because the way Zoom works and the fact that we have the main plenary room and then the breakouts, um, it's not possible for the, um, the if you will, the, the summit team, Chantal, Melissa, myself, to uh, save the chat, uh, the text chat from each of the breakouts. So I know that um, some of you probably had some pretty good comments in the chat um, because each day is a separate Zoom room, that is a separate chat. Um, so just a reminder that if you do want to save your chat uh, for the conversations today and tomorrow, you can do that by accessing the chat window and you'll see the, the three dot ellipsis at the bottom right. If you click that, then you can save the chat. And you can do that as often as you want. Uh, it simply overwrites uh, what is a text file. So just to encourage you or your note taker, or if you don't want to forget because the moderators and note takers are busy, then I'm sure somebody from the team would be happy to do that. Um, don't forget to add your recommendations and actions to the upvote tool. So again, moderators and note takers have the ability to do that. Uh, if you're not clear 
For example, um, I had some initial recommendations from one of our cohorts uh, yesterday. So I'm gonna put those in the upvote tool uh, for them. And so there will be a few extra examples and I'll delete the two samples that I had put in uh, before the summit. So there will be some real examples there from one of our cohorts. Um, so if you do need help with that, just let me know. It's not critical that they get in there uh, today. The only reason it's useful to put them in if you get a chance today is less to do tomorrow. But uh, tomorrow's breakout number five is intended to give you and your colleagues in your breakouts the opportunity to kind of go back, pull the threads out of the notes, highlight them, format them so they're kind of clear in your notes if that's helpful. Um, and then transfer those kind of one sentence summary or actions, statements or actions, ideally with a timeline and stakeholder, if you're able to pin that down and move those over to the upvote tool. And then we'll have a similar exercise while, um, but before I go there, so, so we're starting the, the breakouts, um, breakout number three right now, that goes until, um, uh, two o'clock, so the top of the hour. So you have uh, about 40 minutes or so, depending on, I can't see my clock at this time. Um, and you, as with yesterday, feel free to continue to work in your uh, cohorts during the break. So there's a half hour break starting at two Eastern. And then you have that break time plus uh, the time up to 3.15, and at 3.15, we will pull everybody from the breakouts back into the plenary room, and we'll do a wrap-up. And I have some updates on uh, some new funding calls that have come out and some events that I think would be of interest to people, and maybe I'll, I'll try to pull out some threads from today's conversation. Going into tomorrow, uh, I'll do a, a keynote address on kind of the international landscape uh, and then breakout number five that's there to allow the breakout groups to as i said polish things up that's a good time to put the uh the statements that you have into the upload tool um and then when we all come back to the plenary as the last kind of hour or so of the day that's a point in time where people can go in again and upvote suggestions we will leave the upvote tool open uh, probably till the end of the week. Uh, I won't leave it open for too long because it is a public upvote board. So if people uh, crawl, trawl the upvote boards, they may come across it at some point. So I won't keep it open later than Friday of this week, but you do have until then uh, to go back and take a closer look uh, at the uh, suggestions. So that's really all the instruction I have. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, if so, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself or put your hand up. And as we, as I did yesterday, not always as, uh, as long as I would have liked, I will pop in and out of the breakout rooms to see if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, uh, we'll can you are now free to go into your breakout room. If you're new and you do, we had a few people registered uh, last night and this morning. If you're one of those people, you will be assigned to a cohort uh, very, uh, as soon as we can. So you're free to go into your cohorts, uh, leave the plenary room and go to your breakout rooms. And if you're unsure where you are to be, then just hold on and uh, send a text in the plenary room and Melissa or Chantel or I will get to you. All right, thanks everybody. Martin, we will see you, see you back Martin, shortly. Barton had a quick question about whether or not it's Petra Kucha again tomorrow. No, no, no more Petra Kuchas, unless you want. <laughs> <laughs> if you, I would be, I, I can forego my keynote uh, piece if you would like to do more Pecha Kuchas. <laughs> Barton says no. Okay. <laughs> 
All right, I will leave you to your cohorts. And uh, if you do have any questions or issues, come back to the plenary room. And if I'm not there, Chantal or Melissa will be. All right, so um, I know it's a long day of discussion. Um, so we won't keep people too long. We have a couple more hours tomorrow to uh, get to the finish line. Um, not a lot of uh, threads to pull out of the individual conversations. I popped in and out of most of the groups uh, once for sure, and a couple of times for a few. Um, one thing I noticed is the documents are becoming quite detailed. Uh, lots of good uh, good co uh, conversation, lots of good notes. Uh, some of the groups are starting to um, roll up their basic statements. And I'm going to kind of group this, my comments into three. One is just this part, which again, I don't have much to, to pull out. Um, I'll also um, talk about the upvote. I'm going to talk about the timeline for tomorrow because there may be a little bit of confusion there and so i'll clarify that see if there's any questions and then i'm going to reiterate how the upvoting tool will work and maybe I'll, i might even share my screen just to show how that works for the moderators because this part might be a little more involved uh, and then i'm going to finish off the closing remarks just with a few uh, updates on some upcoming funding calls and, and events um just to leave you uh, with that um when we're ready to go and certainly at any point during these closing comments if anybody has any additional comments or questions just raise your virtual hand and i will get you to open your mic um so again lots of uh i find uh at least for my, myself i don't I haven't engaged outside of the research data alliance i haven't engaged in a lot of this breakout room kind of context, especially when you're going in and out. For those that ever have ever attended a Research Data Alliance event, that's a fairly common occurrence in the physical plenary as well as the uh, most recent virtual. And it sometimes is a little bit disconcerting um, for folks that aren't used to it. And I find if this is the first time you've been in that kind of breakout context in a Zoom platform, it can be a little a little weird for sure. Um, so that's just a comment on the process. I did find when I popped into the rooms, uh, most of the time I didn't say anything because I didn't want to interrupt the conversation because it was going quite well. And it was clear from the notes that um, people were engaged and happy to continue going. <clears throat> there is the normal kind of um, a dropout of in each day as well as as the three days of the summit uh, goes on folks get involved in other business so uh, that again is also expected and hopefully not too too much of a concern um, for people um just to kind of so we've done our four breakouts uh the pecha coaches this morning were awesome um i think that kind of event at the start of a summit like this really helps give people a sense of um of being part of the uh, the larger group as well as the cohort and just gets the creativity flowing um and uh, so just uh i notice uh, scott for example has a comment does anybody want to comment on the flow of this kind of virtual context or using zoom in this kind of meeting um scott refers to the christmas party approach um and uh we probably could have highlighted the lounge a little more prominently for folks to kind of drop in and out that's one of those things i find as i've attended uh, a number of virtual conferences over the last year how you engage because a lot of the really substantial conversations happen in the lounge, the physical lounge after the, the meeting when you're having a bite or, or a drink. 
or even in the hallway as you're moving around in between and you and you spot somebody based on their badge or somebody you know that's really hard to duplicate in the virtual environment um so it's certainly something that we'll we'll uh, learn from from this event um so just for tomorrow to talk about that and then i will take a look at the upvoting uh or sorry i'll do the upvoting last because then i can get rid of my deck and i don't have to share it again so tomorrow is similar timeline i suspect we may close a little bit early we'll see um so one indication of how we may close a little bit early is that early housekeeping i don't think we're going to need much housekeeping time so there's a half an hour book there which i'm pretty sure we won't need uh, so then the keynote will start and that's a half an hour with 15 minutes for comments and questions um 1 15 to 1 30 is any additional instructions on the breakout rooms which again probably will not be too much i can take questions about how that's going to work as well but just to give you a sense so that 1 30 to 4 o'clock uh, 2 o'clock timeline which is the breakout five that's when each of the cohorts has a chance to kind of roll up their comments, extract any of those kind of statements. And I'll, I'll when I show you the upvoting tool, you'll understand why having a, a, a brief or one sentence statement is really important because uh, there is actually a character limit on that piece. Um, so that'll be your opportunity to kind of polish things up. There's no questions, there's nothing specific we're asking you to do in breakout five other than to finish your discussion and derive the kind of the, the kernels of your conversation um from 2 to 2 30 is the break so that's also an opportunity for those as it was in breakout five so that one hour timeline from 1 30 to 2 30 is the opportunity if you haven't done it for breakouts one to four already to enter the statements and any explanatory content into the upvote tool. So whether you've started to do that now, and I'll show you some examples I put in for one of our cohorts, or you decide to do that all in the breakout five and during the break, that's up to you. So that's the opportunity to do that. And then after the break, so 2.30 to uh, 3.15, during that, 45 minute period, I'm gonna ask each cohort and whoever has been nominated or has agreed to kind of provide a summary of the conversation, challenges they had, uh, bright sparks, however you wanna approach it. Um, that's the opportunity to do that. So four minutes for each of the 10 cohorts to kind of do a wrap up. And during that plenary cohort reporting period, people will be able to log into the upvoting tool and use it as they see fit so you can start to take a look at things and do the upvote and then the final closing is was scheduled for 315 to 4 whether or not we need the full 45 minutes uh, that's up to you uh, usually what i do is try to give everybody who's uh, has uh, stuck around to the end an opportunity to make any additional comments that they wish to make. Um, and of course, the upvoting can happen during that time. Uh, we will leave the upvoting open until Friday uh, because I'm imagining that there'll be a little bit more to reading that than, uh, than what would typically you'd have time to do in, uh, in an hour. Uh, but that's up to you. Um, we the ask was that you upvote uh, a maximum of 10 of the comments or suggestions, exactly the same. So the Pecha Kucha upvoting was an opportunity to see how that works. Uh, and once I kind of highlight some of these upcoming items, I'll show you how that upvoting piece will work. So any questions? And I'll, I'll repeat this tomorrow morning, because some folks probably aren't here that will be here tomorrow. Um, so if you have any questions on that, let me know. So I just uh, wanted to do this because this for, for me, this is sometimes one of those things that happens 
either when we have more presentations or when people do have a chance to run into each other in the hallway or at the pub after the uh, event. So I'm just going to highlight a half a dozen or so fairly recent events and funding opportunities. So uh, the uh, PIDS webinar series, the Persistent IDs uh, webinar series, which is being co-hosted and organized by Portage, CRKN, RDC, and Carl. Um, it started last week or the week before, I forget now, with the PIDS 101, but there's five more webinars coming. Uh, the next one is kind of PIDS for researchers, so it will take a slightly gentler approach, I suppose you could say, to the slightly acronym-filled uh, PIDS 101, which I probably should apologize for, but having said that, um, and then we're going to talk about the national international landscape object identifiers, identifiers for people and places and the future of PIDs. So that's a good webinar series and everybody will get the deck um, after our um, summit. But uh, if you just give me a sec, I meant to copy these PID, these uh, URLs into the chat. So let me just do that. So people can take a look while I'm talking. Um, so I just add all the the URLs for the these six or so slides that I'm talking about now. In case you want to look further, <clears throat> further to PIDs, um, uh, RDC has a PIDs working group which is almost finished. A, a new uh, draft version of recommendations of PIDs in the Canadian context. So it provides a background and some explanation of what PIDs are. Uh, as well as kind of best practices for PIDs in particular uh, contexts. So that document is staying open for feedback and public comment until April 16th. So I would encourage you to uh, take a look at any comments or suggestions, uh, take a look, share it with colleagues if they want to learn more about PIDs. Uh, so that document is there <clears throat> for your review. Oops, forgot to color my text. Um, this next one is uh, a map that I created when I reviewed the Andrio white papers so that I could better inform uh, the RDC stakeholder community. So that um, mind map is publicly available. Uh, so you can just click on that link and it will bring up the map of, I think it was 107 as Nizar suggested um, documents. Uh, what I did was I grouped them in broad categories and then tagged them based on um, themes that the Andrio team had derived. Those are the kind of the green shapes on the, the right hand side here, indicated what um, community or what type of stakeholder submitted the white paper, what the domain was, whether it was national, regional, international or local. And then in some cases also highlighted when a particular piece of infrastructure like a data repository was, was mentioned. Um, this will rapidly become out of date in favor of the report that the Andrio team itself is producing. Um, and you can also get access to the, the PDF here, but I did wanna highlight this for people that might want to drill in uh, before Envrio releases their analysis um, in case you want to zero in on uh, white papers in the health sciences or whatever seems to be your interest. Um, I, another mind map that I use a lot is the RDC roadmap. And these are literally the activities that the RDC steering committee uh, uh, kind of agreed were um, priorities. For me as the executive director between now and when RDC transitions into Andrio. So it's grouped by those three high level embedding, embedding the NDSF, building international linkages and partnerships, and strengthening the ecosystem during the Andrio transition. Um, so that's there for you to take a look at if you wish. There's You can click on links and uh, get links to documents for things that are mentioned uh, in the roadmap. So that's a useful way to get a sense of the progress uh, that RDC is making on some of its activities. 
the final webinar series that I'd like to highlight is the one that um, Shelley Stahl and colleagues uh, have spearheaded. Uh, it's called the uh, Data Sharing Seminar Series for Societies. It's excellent. I've gone to the first two. Uh, there's one every month over the course of 12 months. Each one uh, tends to be uh, hosted by a particular domain specific academic, if you will, or scholarly society. These are simply those organizations that have uh, supported the initiative. Uh, the, the one last week, um, I'm blanking on the colleagues, I'll mention them in the uh, keynote tomorrow, but there were 500 uh, attendees uh, in the webinar, um, a lot of them researchers. So a very nice um, way to get a sense of the data sharing interests from different stakeholder groups. Uh, so I would highly recommend that. Um, for those that didn't get a chance to attend the uh, Portage webinar, Portage and Indrio have partnered on a Core Trust Seal uh, certification funding call. Uh, so what this is, is a um, small amount of funding. I, I think it's, and somebody from Portage on the call can correct me if I get this wrong, up to $10,000 for individual data repositories that would like to work in a cohort to go through the Core Trust Seal certification process. Uh, the deadline for applications for that is March 31st. Uh, so it's coming up soon. Um, the goal there, as I said, is to is to build a cohort that will work together over a period of time. And the funding is also there to help or to cover the costs of applying for Core Trust Seal certification, which does have a, a fee. Uh, so that's a great project. Uh, kudos to uh, Corinne uh, and uh, the team that uh, Portage has gathered in their data repositories expert group. Uh, so that uh, call is open. Um, this call is not open, but I did want to mention, re-mention what uh, Nizar mentioned in his keynote uh, speech yesterday, uh, and also uh, highly recommended. Uh, I believe Nizar probably does a monthly blog post. So in his January blog, he mentioned, and I'm just uh, pulling the quote from his blog, mentioned the upcoming call for your inaugural projects in collaboration with national granting agencies. So that the detail of that call is not yet available. The Andrew team is working on those details. Um, so I just wanted to alert folks to the, the fact that there will be, as Nizar highlighted very early in his uh, tenure, uh, an inaugural call from uh, Andrew coming up. So that's uh, positive. And then I think this is the final one. I wanted to mention this one just because it's it's the continuation of uh, Chan Zuckerberg funding for open source uh, for science uh, software development efforts. So this is cycle four. Uh, so the, the funding for this one is dedicated to supporting uh, open source software used in any domain of science, and in particular, supporting the maintenance, growth, development, and community engagement for specific research software science tools. Um, I forgot to look at the, um, the date for that, but the link is, is in there where I added it to the agenda. So that's um, something that, oh, there was one more. Um, also, last week, Portage uh, released the DMP Assistant version 2 which is indeed, Scott, good news, uh, hosted by the University of Alberta, uh, not just in version two, but uh, uh, since its beginning. Uh, so the DMP Assistant is a really important tool that researchers will want to, and people that support the researchers will want to uh, avail themselves of, especially when those, uh, once the Tri-Council data management policy is uh, released and starts to come into effect. Some really nice new features, they're clone DMPs when you've got a you know, common set of research projects, better branding to associate the data management plan with your institution, and a better support for uh, French and English. Um, and that is supported by the Portage Data Management Planning Expert Group, so I have a link there. 
and uh, Robin Nicholson um, is the uh, DMP coordinator. Uh, so they're, she and the rest of that team are doing a great job to uh, bring a shiny new version of the DMP assistant to the community. Um, so while I change my screen share, are there any additional comments or questions? I know that Jeff um, clarified the 10,000 is correct. Um, a few other comments there. Uh, Felipe has an additional comment about the Andrio piece. Um, does anybody want to unmute themselves to mention anything else or anything in more detail? Jeff, do you want to talk about the COVID-19 data stewardship one? Okay, sorry, there, you go. there you go. I, I just wasn't allowed to unmute myself. So oh, okay. um, the, in response, the timelines for the project is a 12 month window for the, um, the, the core trust seal. Um, and it's really in, intended to see repositories uh, attain or make progress toward attaining core trust seal certification. So. Uh, it is not a hard prerequisite that you uh, attain that through core trust seal. I mean, part of the funding, the 10K is also going to help pay for the application fee, which I think is a thousand euros. Um, there's another funding hallmark, the COVID-19 data stewardship that's coming up shortly. Can you view, you didn't mention that yet. No. Okay, so the COVID-19 uh, data stewardship support call will be coming out soon. And it will offer up to $35,000 to support highly, quali highly qualified personnel or HQP in curating data into appropriate um, data repositories. So watch for that as well. Okay, thanks, uh, Jeff. Uh, Felipe, did you want to say anything about the virtual town halls or anybody else want to mention anything, either audio or chat? Yeah, I could I could super briefly mention. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so Andrea will be hosting the virtual town halls on April 19, which are basically uh, the final stage of the needs assessment uh, consultation, and and it will be where we present the initial findings from both the white paper analysis and the survey. It will be very similar in scope and format as uh, NDSF uh, this year. And uh, it will link really nicely to some of the work that has been discussed here. So I think tomorrow I can provide a little blurb of what it will be and uh, just keep an eye open because the, the actual announcement will be set out uh, early next week. Awesome. Thanks, Felipe. Okay. Um, if you do have, um, sorry, I have to get back to my chat here. If you do have any other comments, feel free to put them in chat or updates or uh, just flag me if you want to, uh, or flag the uh, summit organizers if you want to uh, unmute yourself. Um, I see Mike's mentioned a, um, a, a new or recent funding announcement uh, where he's been funded. So that's good news, Mike. Um, if you do want to say something about that, uh, Mike, feel free to unmute and or asked to be unmuted. I'm not sure how that works in this mode, uh, if you want to say more. But uh, there's some information there from Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks, Mark. I'll just, um, just comment that what we're really interested in hearing from you is, um, you know, the, this group probably has more expertise in, in human reluctance to share data than, than any other group that, that we might talk to. So uh, if you're on the usual mailing list, you'll, you'll hear from us because we want to make sure that we're not missing factors. You know, we know there's legitimate reasons why people don't share data, but we're also interested in the ones that boil down to, but I don't want to. And so we're, we're really curious to, to hear from you on that. Well, that's great. Good news. Uh, congrats, Mike. Um, so just to uh, move over to the uh, the final piece I wanted to mention. So hopefully you can see my screen. <clears throat> so right now I'm logged in to my Firefox browser or Safari um, as a note taker or a moderator. 
So, and I'm going to log out when I'm done here, just so that you'll see what most of you will see tomorrow. So what I did uh, just uh, recently, just earlier today was I added in some of the statements from one of our cohorts. Uh, so you can see there's a list of statements. Um, each statement has an indication of which breakout it's from, what the theme was. And sometimes there's more than one theme because the particular uh, statement uh, could easily reflect more than one. Um, when I click on one of those, as a moderator, if I realize after the fact I made a boo-boo, I can go in and edit that. I can also change its status either initially, which I'll show you in a minute, or if I realized again I made a mistake, you can change the status to one of the breakouts. Uh, if you really made a boo-boo, you can always delete it. <laughs> and uh, you can also set the tags. So these are those thematic tags. Uh, and as a uh, moderator or note taker, if you feel it's important, you can also add additional tags. What I tried to do is reflect the key themes that were part of our breakout groups to keep things simple. When you... Um, and as a moderator, you can also add an additional explanation. So I'm just going to go back here. So this add your suggestion will only appear to you if you're a note taker or a moderator and have the ability to add a suggestion. So this is where you add that kernel of wisdom that came out of your group. You'll note that the title is limited to 100 characters, hence that kind of pithy statement. But you can expand on that with up to a thousand characters of additional text. I would encourage you to keep this part brief as well, just to facilitate uh, colleagues' ability to read through these, uh, uh, these suggestions. And then when you're first logged in, it'll ask you name and uh, an email and you sub, uh, agree to consent to allow this to be shared. And this is because it's often used, for example, by a software or a development company that's looking for uh, requests from its customers on how to upload things. So that's how you add a new one. Uh, so for most of you, when you come in here, I'm just gonna log out, you're gonna see uh, a different view. Um, you're gonna see this view. So you'll notice it's pretty much the same. The only difference is I don't have the green button. So I can't add a suggestion. So the suggestions are intended to come from the note takers and or moderators and reflect the group's conversation. As an attendee, you're asked to upvote up to 10 suggestions. So this is the same as putting your sticky note on the chart taped to the wall in previous summits. Um, you can use these same pull downs if you want to kind of limit yourself to the breakout one suggestions or you only want to see the ones that talked about indigenous data sovereignty, then you can do that. There's no suggestions right now on that particular theme, or you can see all tags. So this will help you kind of maneuver your way around uh, the system. And then when you go in, you can add a comment, I've, uh, because I created this, it's remembering through the cookie that I'm the one who did this, so I'm not gonna be able to up, uh, upvote it, but I can add a comment. So when you upvote, you can only upvote each suggestion once, but you can upvote up to 10 suggestions. And I'll go over this again uh, tomorrow. Really useful in this context, maybe even more so than as a note taker, add your comments. So if you think this is an important statement, but you want to enhance it somehow or add something else that you feel has value, then you can add that in as your comment. Um, and that way, again, once the summit is all done, we're gonna take all of this input and produce the final report, uh, which will then be released. Uh, to the community. 
So any questions on the upvote feature? Okay. So again, we'll take a look at that again tomorrow. You can go to the upvote link, which is, there should be a link to the uh, NDSF breakout upvoting board uh, in your individual cohort group. So if you wanna go in there now, feel free. If you're a note taker moderator, anytime you wish to go in and add your suggestions, then uh, please do so. Uh, the more that we have in, once we get back into the plenary in the second half of tomorrow, then the easier it will be. Um, just as to Ernie's question, there is no limit as to the number of statements that an individual cohort group can add. Uh, you can add three, you can add 10, um, you can add 10 for each breakout. Uh, it's up to you. There's no limit on the number of suggestions added. Um, as I said, the only real limit is once you've upvoted uh, a suggestion, you can't upvote it again, which is obviously designed to prevent um, somebody from upvoting their own suggestion or feature. But you can uh, go in and upvote um, one that you haven't already done. And there is no 10 upvote limits, so you could do more. And I'm simply suggesting that you, you go up to 10 uh, just to kind of provide a little bit of a, a common foundation for people's upvoting. Um, so this, this is the URL for the upvote tool. So this is a different link than the Pechacucha board upvote. Um, so that link is specific to the breakouts. And if you go there now as a non note taker moderator, you're only going to see the few that I put in earlier today. And as to Felipe's question, so yes, only note takers and moderators can add suggestions. Um, I had considered doing it a different way, but that um, uh, probably would have led to a little more inconsistency than I would, I would prefer. Bear in mind, again, to reflect individual uh, thoughts, comments in each of those cohort documents, anybody can add notes. And there's also that scratch space. If you don't want to add your notes in the middle of a breakout conversation, then you're free to add any of your own comments or notes in that scratch space, and those will all be read as well. And again, this will be open until Friday. Uh, yes, Mike makes a good, uh, good comment. Okay, um, I'll stop my share. So it's 10 to the hour. We're due to end on the hour. Um, so any other questions before we adjourn for the day? And Chantelle or Melissa, am I correct in this understanding that the Zoom room will be left open until, is it 4.30? That's right, Mark. We'll leave it open until 4.30 and we'll also open up the breakout rooms again because some people uh, forgot to grab their chats. Right. Okay. Um, so breakout rooms and the main plenary will be open for the next little while. So feel free to finish up um, any conversations you're having. All right, we'll see you all tomorrow. Uh, enjoy your evening and thanks again. It's been a very productive and created day. Thanks, everybody.